Oh, good day, everyone, and welcome to a fantastic round one edition of Crowcast. Who would have thought we would be here talking about a famous Crow's victory? So <laughs> I certainly didn't, and I don't think anyone else did either. So uh, rather than just gush about it, let's crack straight in and get going, shall we? G'day, 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 and welcome to our round one edition of the Weekend Wrap, brought to you by Crowcast, of course. Uh, a very, very happy round one Weekend Wrap, and joining me to share in the glory, Macca and Nikki. How are you going, guys? Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't have much of a voice, so I apologise for my... I may, may crack at some stage, uh, but that was a very nice weekend. Wasn't it just uh, and- brilliant? It was outstanding, no, it's fantastic, and uh, I would say that uh, it's probably one of the most emotional I've got in a football game for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah. I know, at that last quarter, it just seemed to go on forever and ever and ever. <laughs> yeah, about two days, it seemed like. <laughs> I mean, how quickly we've gotten used to the shorter quarters, now they're back out to the... Uh, to the main regulation. Court, the regulation, and it's like, oh my god, will it just end? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to apologise on behalf of everybody else that we couldn't get past fifteen goals. I'm blaming it entirely on Ron, uh, one of the friends who we sit with, because before the game, did a little poll in in our area and said, how many goals are we going to kick for the game? I predicted six. Ron said fifteen. <laughs> right. And so when we got to thirteen, we're like, ah, and then we got to fifteen, it's like. It's all your fault, Ron, if they run over us. Hey, look, I've got a theory. I, I reckon I, I can't remember the last team that scored 100 points and lost. So once we got to 15 goals, I thought, oh, we've got this. <laughs> but <laughs> bloody hell, they made hard work of it, didn't they? Uh, well, look, another uh, another fact there, Fiend, was the fact that um, us beating uh, Geelong is the first time in the AFL history that a uh, a cellar dweller, sp- and a spoon man, <laughs> spoon team, uh, has beaten a grand finalist in the first game of the year. Yeah, and it couldn't have happened to a better team in Geelong. Uh, <laughs> look, good day to everyone. Good day to everyone who's joined us on YouTube and on Twitch and uh, chatting away with us on Discord. It's great to uh, have everyone on. I'm sure we're all up and about tonight, so uh, <laughs> we won't try and drag this on to three hours. Um, Nikki and Macca, we <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, my, we my won't do that. Asked, yeah, my oh. mum asked me tonight and she said, oh, how long do you normally podcast for? An hour? And I just started laughing. <laughs> yeah. and go, That's what we're supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's let's just try and keep it at an hour, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. All right. Well, look, we've got a bit to go through. Of course, the girls had a good win today as well, and there were lots of other matches going around. Now, I'm making a bit of a pact with everyone this year because everyone gets shitty that we spend 20 minutes talking about the other games. So we're not going to spend 20 minutes talking about the other games, right? We're not going yes. to... You hear that, Macca? do that? Uh, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> All we are going to do is quickly go through the results and the ladder and then we'll get straight into the real stuff, okay? So here we go. Thursday, Richmond predictably with the 15-goal rule, uh, 15-15-105 to Carlton 11-14-80. Carlton didn't look too bad, but uh, uh, Richmond getting up predictably. Uh, On Friday night, uh, Collingwood looked a bit of a rabble. Uh, The Bulldogs getting up. Uh, there by 16 points in the end, 10 9, 69 to 7 11, 53. Uh, Yesterday, apart from our famous victory, we had Melbourne getting up over Fremantle 11 14 80 to uh, Fremantle 8 10 58, there, a margin of 22 points. Uh, Hawthorne getting up in a thriller by one point, uh, 14 goals 8 92 to Essendon uh, 13 13 91, a dagger through the heart of Ben Rutten. 
Um, Sydney, a really good first up win for the young Sydney team against another contender from last year, Brisbane. Sydney 19 11, 1 2 5 to Brisbane 14 10 94. Logan McDonald kicking a lazy three on debut. Yeah. And then today, well then today, we had uh, the power smashing north uh, by 52 points 17 15, 1 1 7 to north. 9 11 65 and uh St Kilda a really good win first up 13 8 86 uh to 11 12 78 margin there of eight points and I'd be uh interested for anyone who watched that game to uh tell us how Brad Crouch went and going well, on well, he, did, moment, he never played mate he never oh, played. Didn't he? He's just suspended. Oh, He's suspended oh, for that's two right, weeks. Of course, yeah, that's right. Of course, no wonder they won. Um, and the game <laughs> going on at the moment: uh, the Suns up by a point over West Coast. Uh, the Suns seven eight fifty to West Coast seven seven forty nine. We will keep an eye on that one. All right. Uh, very quickly, Macca and Nikki, your thoughts on the round so far? Well, I thought that. Um... There were quite a few surprises, really, when you think about it. I mean, Richmond probably went to plan. Um, Damien, Damien Martin just playing, uh, not Damien Martin, Dustin Martin playing an absolute cork of a game. And yeah. Bulldogs, I think, uh, I think they sent out a message. They're going to be a fairly good side this year. They they just have an outstanding midfield. They've got so many good midf- um, midfielders. They might be weak in other spots, but got, they will get a lot of the ball. Um, Melbourne versus Freo, I thought that Freo... We're not going through every game, Macca. Not going through every game. Just your overall goals, bro. Well, I'm just telling you what I thought of the team (laughs) in the sense that who looked like they could be a finalist. And I'm just saying Melbourne possibly. Um, Ah, Too early. Too early. Essendon North and nothing there. Swans and Brisbane. Brisbane were pathetic, but they'll play better than that. And Port, well, they were outstanding. Uh, Yeah, so that's basically... The GWS and the Saints, well, I think I thought the Saints they got up, but they weren't that good either. So um, I think it's just still of what the games played. I know Port only played North Melbourne. Gee, they look good though. All right, I'm cutting you off, Nick. I only really watched the the two games, and then there were other stuff going on and getting to hours, etc. But by the look of it, it seemed that those teams that played in the finals, they, there was a bit of flatness to them. Very which early start. Yeah, which you can't. Yeah, you kind of predict, and the fact that we've only had one real preseason game, I, I think that has shown through a little bit. Um, how many times uh, commentators can say, say fatigued? If you're doing that as a drinking game, I think you might be drunk by the third quarter. Um, yeah. but and, and I think that's that's kind of where it's at. Um, I agree. Dogs looked really good. Collingwood, I think, are in a bit of trouble. Yeah, um, I agree. Big trouble. Big but trouble. It, Big trouble. I, I think there's actually going to be a whole lot of movement around the middle. I think there's a whole lot of teams that fit there. So it's going to be luck of injuries, etc., as to what plays out there. Yeah. A couple, couple of interesting games uh, coming up next week. Sydney versus us is going to be an interesting one. Two young yeah. teams. Um, yeah. We've got uh, the Bulldogs and West Coast shaping up to be a good one, I think. Uh, St Kilda and Melbourne will also be a good one. Um, so... Interesting first up. I mean, obviously, we sit six. There's not much point going through the ladder after round one, but uh, um, very interesting. Wait, we're in uh, the eight. Yeah, we're in the eight, and uh, <laughs> we'll just, it may not we'll, last. <laughs> we'll take that. We will take that. <laughs> but look, you know, let, let's just uh, talk about Adelaide's win um, straight off the bat because it was a famous victory. Adelaide, 15 goals, 13, 103. To Geelong, 13, 13, 91. In the end, a margin of 12 points. We were out by 40-something at some stage during that uh, early in the third quarter. Um, and predictably, with uh, a couple of injuries, well, really four injuries, uh, yeah. uh, t- two of them were still out on the ground, McAdam and uh, Hinge. Uh, but obviously, Kelly knocked out by uh, that salty flog danger field. And, um, Who's his best mate? Well, not for much longer because... I'm telling you right now, and the news is that Danger's been referred straight to the uh, tribunal. Good. So he's, I only had two. He'll, he'll definitely get two and probably get three. He, he deserves three. Yeah. Um, now, Macro, I'm feeding back through your speakers as usual. Um, um, I can't help it. I've got this bloody laptop, mate. What can I do? I don't know. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> We're off that, to a good that, start. That that was a that was if they say there was no intent, uh, they're lying. Yeah, it was intent. Dangerfield got run down by was it Hamill? I think. Yes, um, excellent run down by Hamill. Pissed off about it, and he got up and he just barreled uh, Jake Kelly. Um, and those who say he wasn't on the ground, he certainly was off the ground when he, he made contact. Both feet were off the ground, and even he though did, he didn't he make did contact, rise with, up. yeah, he did. Absolutely, he did. Well, Absolutely, no, 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 he, he did. did. No, like other ones where they really rise up, he did a little bit, but he jumped off the ground to give it more momentum. So it was more sideways than it was up because most of the time when they're talking about coming off the ground, they talk about the upwards movement. Nikki, he but, was very, very lucky that he didn't make contact with his shoulder because I, he would have been I out know. for eight weeks. He'll be out, he'll be out for three to four, I reckon. Um, but I reckon if it had, if had jumped any higher... Um, then he would have been out for eight. And poor old yeah. Jake was out before he hit the ground. I don't think, think, think for one moment that Patrick really tried to knock him out, but the rule is he now that... He tried to hurt you, him, Macca. He tried yeah, to hurt him. him. No, yep. no the, the rule is this now, that if you choose to bump, you have to accept the consequences that go with it. In other words, your bump, your bump was deliberate and the result of it will be regarded as being deliberate as well. Uh, he definitely went to look. I don't care what like, anyone says. He definitely went to flatten him because um, most other players in that circumstance, he knew he wasn't going to get to Kelly before Kelly released the ball. Most other players would have gone the smother, um, but he didn't go the smother. He didn't have any eyes on what Jake was doing. He had eyes for Jake, and uh, if you don't get three to four, I'm going to be. Uh, very annoyed because uh, he certainly deserves it. All right. Um, look, the head-to-head stats were quite interesting. I've uh, I realised this afternoon that I used to do like you know graphs and shit, <laughs> and I thought, oh, I haven't done them today, so I better bloody do them. So what we'll do, we'll run through the AFL's uh, website. And then uh, we'll just have a look at them in a bit more detail because the AFL's uh, stats aren't too bad now, uh, which is good. So just let me bring that up for a second. Team stats, here we go. Um, all right, so uh, overall, uh, Geelong 349 to 317 stat uh, disposals. Uh, kicks fairly even, 199 to 195 our way. Handballs, 118 to 154. Geelong, particularly after halftime, and we'll, we'll have a look when we uh, uh, dive into these a little bit more, uh, they stepped up their handball count after halftime. They changed the way that they played completely. Uh, inside 50s were even, 51 to 52. Yeah. Dis- disposal efficiency, uh, 71 to 76. Uh, again, uh, that changed throughout the match. Efficiency inside 50, um, we were just under 60%. Um, Geelong were 55.8. We were up around 70 uh, at halftime uh, from memory. Um, so obviously with that fast movement and that really good system into our forward 50 in the first half. Uh, second half, Geelong got numbers back and it became a little bit more difficult. Um, we smashed them in free kicks, 31 to 15. <laughs> I thought we did get a few dubious ones, but then again, Geelong got three goals after half time from direct free kicks. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, but honestly, most of those frees were there, um, or they were consistent both ways in the way they paid them. And yeah. there were a whole lot that were missed. So we actually should have had more frees. Yeah, but well, you get that. Than what we paid. We've had plenty, plenty of games where we've been absolutely slaughtered by the ump. So if we did oh, get a, a, a bit of a, a, a turn this time, well, it was our turn. You know, we've missed out for about twenty turns. Hundred um, percent. Hit out thirty-one apiece. Uh, we'll talk about Riley a little bit later. Clearances thirty-six to thirty-eight, which included twelve to fifteen in the centre and twenty-four to twenty-three round stoppage. Uh, contested posies, uh, which is where Nix is really building his game. One thirty-nine to one twenty-seven. And that ended up a bit closer than what it was for large portions of the game. Uncontested possessions, 174 to 218. That blew out as the game went on. Uh, turnovers, we were surprisingly efficient, 54 to 62 in favour of us. Um, we ended up... 
this is a very interesting stat uh, time in possession we ended up 46 percent time in possession to um geelong's 38 but for most of the game we were actually uh behind on time on possession we were using the ball very efficiently uh, going forward but obviously as the game wore on and geelong got numbers back uh, we were forced to chip around but I, I felt we handled that situation far better than we have in previous yep. years where we've just banged it on a tall defender's head so uh, that was good to see uh, marks 90 to 80 uh, marks inside 50 uh, 13 to 12 contested marks 12 to 7 which is good um tackles 60 to 59 uh, that tackle count looked a little low but i think when you've got three blokes tackling and one bloke, I think they only count that as one tackle. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I want to know, did McHenry get the four tackles in a row? But oh, I think he geez. was kind of like the second or third one in. But that was brilliant bit of play. Yeah, yeah. Um, tackles inside 58 to 13. Um, one percent is 36 to 40, fairly even there. So, uh, yeah, look, not a huge amount standing out in the stats but it was really a game of two halves which is why it's worth um, drilling down a little bit because uh, certainly in the first half and I'll just see if I can bring this up uh, in the first half we um, we dominated a lot of um, pressure stats and uh, so let's just have a look first of all at uh, let's just start with something nice and easy disposal you can see there that um, we did beat Geelong in disposal in the first half, um, but in the second half they uh, started to possess the ball a little bit more, and that's reflected in that. Um, let's see if I can. See. I don't know whether I charted that time in possession. Yeah. Well, yeah, so that, that's said. The two players down back. They're two extra players. They were kind of getting back. Yeah. So where there was a turnover, they were then. You can see yeah, why yeah. those little chip kicks happening. So you can see uh, Geelong uh, dominated time in possession in the first half. They actually had the ball quite a bit. Um, we just got a lot of value, particularly in that second quarter. We got a lot of value from um, possession. Um, so we were able to force them. We for, What I noticed, and, and Mac and Nicky, uh, I'm interested to see if you notice this, in the past, Geelong has killed us going through the corridor, and yet I felt that we guarded the corridor far better um, than we have in previous years against them, and it forced them to change up the way they were playing. And a lot of that was just down to pressure. Well, yep. you're 100% right there, Fiend, because mostly they did come around the flanks, and, and for the very reason that you mentioned. It was only in the, you know, as we, as we tied in that last quarter, and you know, the, an endurance beast uh, like, uh, is it Smith? Who was the name of the, the Hawthorne guy? Ian yeah, Smith, Isaac right? Smith. Isaac Smith, Smith. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Isaac Smith. Yeah, he, he stood out because he could, and he was running from the wing cutting in rather than going straight through the centre thing. So yeah. even then we were still trying to do it. So, but yeah, you're right. That, that, that was obviously part of our game plan was to force them to do that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, the the, 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 the couple of times they were able to get it through the middle, it was a bit lazy on behalf of our midfielders. And as much as I hate to say this, it was Sloan that wasn't quite doing the defensive pressure or giving too much space to his opponent. And a number of their goals or shots on goals were a direct result of him doing that. The youngsters, as you would expect, being that up and about, were the ones creating that better pressure. Yeah. Um, contested possession, you can see um, throughout the whole match, but particularly in the first half, I've got it up there on the screen right now, um, we monstered them in contested possession, and I know that that's a key indicator um, for Matthew Nix. Um, and even when they came back at us, um, they... <sighs> As you really point out, they probably got us on the on the turnover a little bit in that second half. Yep. Um, our defensive running dropped off a little bit just because we were cooked. Um, but it was really pleasing to see that our attack at the contest and our ability to win contested ball um, didn't drop off in the second half. Um, it remained uh, intense. And, uh, I th you know, that just meant that even though Geelong did get some easy ball, they also... Um, their their efficiency going into forward fifty was was impacted by the fact that um, we were still putting pressure on them. Yep. Pressure on them. 
and we were pushing them out wide. I mean, one of the few times Hawkins was able to beat Butts, it was right on the boundary line. Yeah. You know, that's the only space Butts gave him. Um, and But the other thing I really noticed, which I think was a great counter, was the fact that when we had a mark, we often handballed. It wasn't a kick because that player can't, on the mark, can't intercept by the time the handball's gone, the player's passed them. Yeah, that, 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 the I whole pub's doing that, Nick. The, that's, yeah. the, that's going to be, uh, become the, the, the main way of attacking. Yep. And it was great to see that we were doing it and we were making the right choice of that handball run past as well. Well, I think we really benefited from the, um, and we've obviously trained it, the uh, standing on the mark rule. Uh, yep. We really did benefit from that. We were able to, and <laughs> bloke like Tommy Lynch, who normally will kick at least one or two into the man on the mark, uh, all of a sudden he can kick those drilling <laughs> low passes into the forward yeah. 50 because he can get around. So, yeah, um, that's exactly what happened. Exactly what did happen, Fiend. And I'll tell you what, I, I thought he played very well with, with that because often he, he didn't really have an option, but he created one by doing that. And other and and made and forced somebody to lead. Yeah. Well, Nikki Nikki's observation is very accurate. We did play on off the mark. Um, we we uh, intentionally slowed it down um, when they got behind the ball, uh, and I think we also intentionally yeah. slowed it down just to save a few petrol tickets because we were down on yep. rotations. Nick um, said that. Um, yeah. But you can have a look here. I've I've charted the. Def- the uh, efficiency into forward 50 and you can see we're just off the charts our, our efficiency in the second quarter was into the forward 50 was 70 percent which means that 70 percent of our um our entries into forward 50 uh resulted in a in a shot on goal now that's that's immense 70 percent that and we haven't seen that from an adelaide team even even in our halcyon days of 2017 we weren't known as an efficient forward 50 uh, entry team we were we yeah. were known as a fast running rebounding team that would run in and you know uh, get goals that way but to be able to hit up targets inside forward 50 in scoring positions was fantastic yeah you're 100 percent right there Fiend. um and that and we've got to give uh, rohili a great big pat on the back on that uh, with that because he's actually created a totally different structure up forward than we normally have you know we normally have the three lumbering forwards all getting in in the way of each other and uh, Lynch down on the half forward flank, and uh, and you maybe have maybe if you're lucky, you might get two little guys. But um, at times they were up to four smalls running around there in the forward line, and uh, it created havoc for Geelong because uh, they didn't really have uh, the same sort of structure to man up. And uh, uh, I thought uh, I- we really now have got a proper forward coach because you know the structure up forward was fantastic. Well, and it's fair to say too that I reckon Raleigh probably helped Geordie Butts too in how he played Tommy Hawkins. Um, yeah. We'll go through individuals in a minute, but um, it was quite noticeable how Jordan was playing Tommy and you'd think that James would have had an input into that. Um, interestingly, just talking about disposal efficiency, as, as much as we were efficient going into the forward 50, overall uh, Geelong were far more efficient with the ball, but I feel like that's because we held them up a fair bit and force them to chip around and, and go a little bit wider. Um, our disposal efficiency sort of hovered around the 70 mark, which is pretty good. And it actually um, surprisingly increased in the second half despite tired legs and pressure. But I think that was also indicative of the way we changed the way that we played. And I just want to ask you guys, when was the last time you saw an Adelaide Crows team change their game style during a match? <laughs> Not too uh, often. Last year, a couple of times towards the end. Yeah, prior to well, Knicks. Prior to Knicks. Yeah. Prior to Knicks, no. No, we just used to keep bashing away with the same thing that wasn't working at the time. So yep. you're quite right there, Fleen. I Actually, I think that it um, the win, more than anything, uh, it did put a, a stamp on Nix's uh, game plan that the, yep. when we do play it properly, that it will work. Last year, the poor bastard never had a coach. He had uh, blowflies helping him as assistant coaches. <laughs> and uh, this year, he's got, he's got proper professionals. And uh, uh, you can see that by the way we're structured, by the way we play, by the way we move the ball. And 
Nick said quite rightly, this is what I've been, what we were trying to do last year. Yeah. But, he yeah. had no, but he had no hope last year, poor bugger. Well, no, not but, only... they kept, but they kept their heads up last year, which is a credit to him being able to do that with that team, with what was happening, that they kept their heads up. The other thing was it was very, our game style that I saw from him was very Richmond. Very, yeah. very Richmond. Yeah, not unlike it at all. That mm. just pressure forward, forward, push, 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 get it out, particularly in that first quarter with that pressure, just keep paddling the ball forward, little quick kick, but it's to where we had other players, not a blind kick in hope, and then we got it deeper and we could get those nice forward 50 entries. It just yes. really reminded me of very Richmond-like. Well, I didn't – I'm not going to quite agree with you there, Nick, because – I said Richmond, Richmond like. Yeah, uh, and I'm saying I don't quite agree. <laughs> because <laughs> Richmond Richmond handball forward quite a bit. Um, yeah, they, 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 they very do. Very much a, a forward running uh, team. I, I felt Everything's like we forward. were a little bit more um, considered in the way that we went forward. What we were what we were really good at doing though is is the overlap running, um, where we were able to create options. But I felt like. In some respects, it actually reminded me of the way Hawthorne used to play in terms of their spotting up, spotting up, spotting up. Um, and there were times in that first half where it looked a little bit like Hawthorne. But where I will agree with you regarding Richmond is the way that we actually structured up up forward. Um, yeah. You know, we we had a, a leading Tex Walker, wasn't it? And we'll, I don't want to go on about Tex just yet, but we bloody well will. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, we had the the strong marking Frampton, uh, which is quite reminiscent of the uh, revolt. Um, well, the, the, um, the crash Lynch, the the revolt Lynch combination, and then you had your smalls there, Shane McAdam. You know, not that he's Dusty Martin, but he plays a similar role. You know, um, so it in terms of the way we structured our forward line, I, I felt that was quite Richmond like. The the way we went into our forward line, I felt was a little bit more considered than what Richmond would normally do, but I'm not going to yeah. argue the point. Um, just a couple of other notable... Um, I'll, I'll just Can I just say that forward line, I really enjoyed it at one stage when we had Murphy as our centre-half forward. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then he, he, he was flanked by, um, I think, Schoenberg on one side and uh, McHenry on the other. Well, I, 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 I you know, uh, Fane's exactly right what he just said, actually. It, yeah. Uh, it's more of the... The two tools and then the, the, the smalls, uh, that's that's more Richmond-like, but uh, the movement of the ball is not quite exactly the same because everything with uh, Richmond is just forward, forward. It doesn't matter how they call it chaos football, and I think we, we were trying to be a lot more precise than that. But um, we were going as forward as much as possible, and uh, we were definitely trying to, to run the ball in there very quickly as well to catch them off guard, um, and I think and we did that many, many times. So... Uh, it's it's uh, it's just a comp you know I mean it, it, the, the game style is really a composition of several uh, teams like as uh, Fiend said a bit like Hawthorne used to move it yeah uh, the structure up forward a bit like Richmond you know it's Nix's adaptation of little bits out of everybody's game plan it's going to be his game plan and I tell you what it worked very very well and it would have worked longer and stronger if we weren't playing with that with two rotations less which is on a thirty yeah. degree day is so telling. Otherwise, they, I don't believe they would, the have got, they would not have got as close. Nowhere near yeah. it. Without, no. the, without the lack of rotations, if we'd had the same number of rotations as they did with, with players, I believe we probably would have won by, I'd say, maybe five or six goals. 100%. Agreed. Mate. Um, I, I feel like we were completely on top um, ha half time, And you knew they were going to come back. Um, but uh, to, to the coaching staff's credit, they recognised the situation and they adapted. And the players were um, were good enough to adapt to uh, the change in the game style and execute it. We continue to execute. There were certainly – fatigue certainly played a part um, towards yep. the end in terms of skill errors and decisions and, and probably not providing as many options as we'd provided in the first half. But the endeavour was still there. I mean, I've just – this stat here, contested possessions. Uh, no, sorry, this is clearances. Um, 
you know, we stayed with it. Even when Dangerfield had that little purple patch, we still stayed with them. We still focused on the 1% efforts and, and the, um, you know, the the contested possessions. We, we beat them all day, you know. So that was, to me, the most cl- the most pleasing part of everything was the fact that we continued to um, apply pressure um, we out tackled them during the game all day. So even when we were fatigued, we were still able to continue to apply pressure. And in the end, that's what got us over the line because Geelong just weren't accomplished enough um, on the day to be able to, to, to be able to deal with it. Yeah, one thing I think it was very, very clear from the selection of the team that they have taken, they only took into the, this particular game players that were prepared, uh, prepared to get absolutely buggered, to bleed, to do whatever's necessary to try to win. And that was in, the, you know, like Berry playing his first game. Other players like uh, uh, Butts down back, standing, the, you know, the, the goal kicking champion of many, many a year, and he's a three gamer. I mean, yeah. they, they still had the faith in them to put a, and they, they put their faith in the boys that would, do, would give everything they've got rather than just give up every so often, like some of them have in the past. Well, yeah. and you know, um, as PJ said on the chat, that's all about buying. You know, that is all about buying into the coach's philosophy, buying into the to a team ethos, um, and playing for one another. And you know, there's been some very interesting quotes from Nick's um, and people around Nick's over the last six months. And one thing that has stood out is that perhaps the Crows in the last two to three years have. It's not that they've dropped off uh, a team ethos, but there's become an element of self-preservation about the way individuals have played. And I think that was one of the big challenges for for Nick's and the coaching staff to eradicate was to make the teams uh, play a selfless brand of football once again. And I think he's it. Judging by uh, that first round, uh, he's achieved that. The players are playing for each other. They're backing each other up. They're um, uh, well, I mean, there were two or three fantastic rundown tackles. Uh, there were lots of intercept marking. There was lots of coming over the top spoiling. There was lots of over, overlap run, lots of defensive effort. And that comes because not only have you bought into the coach's philosophy, but you're also playing for your mates. You're not playing for yourself. You're playing for your mates. Yeah, well, and PJ, that's... Sorry, Nick. Uh, but PJ's got an excellent point. The, co- the coaching staff and admin wasted two years trying to save their own careers by playing players, by playing players who were trying to save their own careers. I mean, it's, it's a, a genuine statement because um, the coaching staff never ever uh, showed any initiative, as, they, as he quite no, rightly said. They, uh, it was just more like trying to save their own backside rather than trying to win a premiership. Uh, and win, win, you know, and get the boys to play well. An interesting fact, though, theme which I did tweet. Um, if you have a look who played and who didn't play, our first selection at the draft for the last four years was available. Were they were, four of them were available, and none yep. of them were selected. Yeah. Now that that says a lot about who they're going to select, doesn't it? Well, it says um, only those who are prepared to bleed. Look, we can we can transition on to. Uh, talking about individuals, and that probably will lead into some discussion about certain individuals um, because uh, there were some selections that certainly had me scratching my head. Tommy Lynch, I didn't think, uh, should have been selected. Um, I was distressed that Darcy Fogarty wasn't played, um, and yet I think the coaching staff and the selection panel were quite vindicated by selecting Tom Lynch. Um, and. Why don't we just have a look at Lynch's stats first up because uh, I just felt like he, he played a massive game, Tom Lynch. Yep. He was good. Um, well, my, my impression of him was he – well, normally his first game kind of back from an injury, he's not good um, and it takes him two games to get into it. So I was a little worried. But I looked at that forward line and I thought, well, only him and Walker are actually the only senior players and we either had one or the other 
sometimes they were on at the same time, but if one was off, the other one was still there. So they were there to control and help that young forward line. Um, and I think it just kind of felt like as well that he knows there's youngsters that are trying to take his spot. And if he wants to stay in that team, he's got to pull his finger out. Well, I mean, Lynch played the role that Lynch always plays, which is that um, connector role. But yeah. he did it for four quarters. So he had four disposals in the first, three in the second, five in the third, and four in the in the last quarter. So he trended upwards as the game wore on, which is which is um, for a senior player. That's exactly what we want. Um, yeah. His disposal efficiency um, was uh, pretty amazing in the first half he was at one stage he was tracking at 100 um, percent in the first quarter 100 percent disposal efficiency uh 100 percent disposal efficiency in the second quarter um faded a little bit after half time but to have tom faded lynch, to 94.1 percent yeah to have tom lynch basically running at 100 percent disposal efficiency for a half of football and picking up you know 11 possessions uh in doing so you're going to get val- that's giving you value, and and he was one of the main reasons why our forward fifty entry dispo- uh, efficiency was so high, because he just kept hitting targets. Spot on, mate. Exactly. You know, um, so I, I thought, you know, I, I wanted the club to play Tex in Lynch's role and play Darcy deep, um, and you know whether that would have been a good idea or not, who knows? But I think. As it turns out, the way in which they struck it up, having uh, Tommy playing high and Tex playing uh, a deeper role, um, you know, it clearly clearly worked. I mean, uh, Tom, how many goals did Tom kick? Did he kick any goals? He kicked Just one in one. the first, one. didn't he? That, that, yeah. that, that amazing one in the first. But four goal assists, and, that, and they were just beautiful passes right onto the chest. Well, I've just got it on the graph here, score involvements. Uh, he had three score involvements in the first quarter, three in the second, three in the third, and one in the last. So that's 10 score involvements for the game out of 25 that's scoring it. shots. You know, Tremendous. So um, he had a massive game. I don't think his game yeah. should be understated. I think he's been overlooked a little bit in um, proceedings, uh, the wrap-up. But I think Tom Lynch's game should not be... Uh, understated because he was massive for us, and he was in, he was a key player in getting us um, into that winning position at half time. Yeah, I can't argue with that. And you know, it's good to see that uh, at least he's got the he's got the uh, ability to adapt his game to what what's required of him, and uh, uh, and did it and did it uh, to perfection. I thought. Yep, um, Billy Frampton was the other. Um, selection that many were questioning because we wanted Elliot Himmelberg in, although my my understanding is that Elliot's not quite ready fitness-wise. But in terms of form, you cannot fault uh, Billy Frampton at the moment. And again, yep. the score involvements, he had five score involvements for the game. Um, how many goals did he kick? He kicked um, one in the first quarter. Should have had another, actually. He hit the post and... Uh, yeah, two two he kicked. Yeah. Yes. It was yeah. it was a handy point. So, you know, um but just his, his ability to mark uh and and provide a contest um up forward um aggressively meant that even if he didn't mark it, I mean he only took uh, what did he take? Five marks for the game, uh three in the third quarter, which was uh, a a real plus for us when we were starting to struggle. Um but the manner in which he was attacking the contest meant that they weren't getting easy rebounds out of defensive 50 because they weren't yep. owning that contest. They weren't monstering that contest, which is what's been happening quite a bit in those one-on-one marking contests. We Not only would we get beaten, but the opponent would be able to control the contest and they'd be able to run clear and we'd be out of position. So uh, a great game from Frampton and irrespective of what Elliot uh, does fitness-wise over the next couple of weeks, Elliot's going to have a tough time to uh, dislodge Billy on current form. Yep, and just to back your point up, um, Brandon had 14 disposals and he had a, and uh, eight of those came from taking marks and some of those were very highly contested marks. So 
and he followed up with two goal two. As you say, hit the post. That should have been a goal. But he, re- I thought he was, and he did very quite well when he was relieving in ruck as well. So I thought he was de- in our best players actually. Well, when, again, yeah, if you look Monday. at if you look at the trend, um, you know everyone was probably talking about Billy's first half because it came out of the blocks really well. He only had three disposals in the first first half. He had seven disposals in the second half when the heat was really on. But not only that, that was when we changed up our game plan. Um, and don't forget, we were hitting up Tex almost at will in that first half. Um, in the second half, we were having to move slower. Geelong had players back. And that and for Billy to have seven posies in that second half went in a crowded uh, forward 50 um, is really uh, indicative of how he played his game and how he contested. So um, uh, awesome effort from, from Billy Frampton. And, and he and Walker worked really well when they were both deep, not getting in each other's way. Yeah, that was a big point, Nicky, that because one was basically the high marker and an occasional leader, but Tex was definitely the leader. Uh, yep. So it, it, they really did cooperate very well. Well, let's talk about Tex um, because, um, again, a lot of people have been writing him off, including probably us. I would say, or, you know, not so much writing him off, but certainly thinking that maybe it's time that Darcy was given um, uh, given a bit of a crack. But no, uh, I, did, I think we did, we did write him off, though. <laughs> we did. To have 14 disposals up to half time um, and 18 for the match was just amazing. Just amazing. Yeah. 14 disposals. Um, he obviously kicked the five goals. Um, as well, uh, four in the first half. Um, <clears throat> his score involvements, just let me bring that up. Uh, where are we? Score involvements. You know, nine score involvements. So between him and Tommy Lynch, uh, Tommy Lynch having 10 and Tex having nine, uh, it just shows you how well they were connecting. Um, and it also shows, in my opinion, the, the fact that Tex dropped off in the second half shows what we need to be able to provide him in order to get the best out of him, and that is an open forward line. Exactly. He, he's, not a, he's not a strong overhead mark, and he never has been. Um, but he's always, in fact, when he uh, was playing as a youngster, that he's, he used to burst out on the lead, and that was really basically how he got all his goals. But then for some reason we tried we try to turn him into a guy that, that takes pack marks, and he just doesn't do that. And it did look like he was on the way out. And then, and we did call it last year that uh, we thought he'd be lucky to be playing this year. But, um, you know, I, I'm going to say I said it and, uh, and I was wrong because he's actually, well, he's realised that he needs to be a lot more mobile and, he, and he's definitely fitter and he's more aerobically fitter. And uh, I thought that he, he that's the best I've seen him move in about five years, I reckon. And uh, Oh, no doubt about like, it. And if he plays like that, well, it really just yeah, it, it sets the whole four line all right. He was outstanding. He was best player. I just Sorry, I Nick, thought he was outstanding. Yeah. Nick, what were you oh, saying? Oh, no, I was, just, I was just agreeing with you guys that, you know, he just looks so fit. Just he wasn't held back at all. We suspected he'd been carrying an injury last year and probably the year before. And how free he just was in his movements, it yeah. was just yeah. so noticeable. Because of that, that gave him the little bit of a lift. That gave the younger guys, I think also having all those younger guys around him and that infectious um, like fight that they brought, I, th- I think that just kind of helped and built into it as well. Look, I think I think that it comes down to a simple case of we had an open forward line. We just had an open forward yeah. line, yep. and we we gave Tex the V, and he took it. And uh, he's not going to get that all season. Uh, in fact, I'd be surprised if he gets it very often for the rest of the season. He only got it for a half a game um, and kicked five goals. Now every other coach in the competition is going to see that if you allow Adelaide an open forward line, they're going to kill you because Texas Mm. is up and about. So 
I don't think that we're going to see too many um, too many times during the season where we have um, that luxury. So and yeah. so, I think you know, uh, without being a dickhead, I think that my point regarding playing Tex up the ground, I, I'm still sitting on that because I still think eventually, as we get worked out and as the game slows down during winter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think Texas value. We've seen what Texas value is in terms of being able to hit up hit up the ball, lead up. We're just gonna to have to play him a little bit higher so that he doesn't get nullified. Yeah, it'll be interesting how we do structure up then. And but I do I've got a little bit of faith in these coaches to actually adjust our game plan as they did show actually uh, on the game that just got Yeah, I'm just talking they... about tech, Texas effectiveness is what I'm what I'm talking about here. Is yeah, if we're going to get the most out of him, he will get blanketed if if we play him for long periods in like coming out of the square, basically, which is what we were doing in the first half on the weekend. No, I, I I'm agreeing with you, but then they they yeah. just might just have to move him further up the ground, yeah. and uh, he can he can still have a, a good effect on the game from there. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and I hope they do because the way, because the way that he's moving around, yeah, he's capable of it. Yep. Hundred um, percent. All right, Rory Laird. I thought had a really strong, consistent game. Um, he had yep. twelve disposals in the first half, and also twelve in the second half. So very consistent. In fact, um, as with a lot of the players, his strongest quarter was his third quarter, uh, where he had eight disposals. Um, I felt like his. Let's just check his disposal efficiency because I felt he used the ball pretty well. Um, so yeah, for around about the seventy mark, so not terrible. Um, no. And for for a little under midfielder though, that's under a lot of pressure. To me, that's acceptable. Yeah, I agree, Nicky. I thought, I thought his work ethic was terrific, and that's um, that, that's what I like. Yeah, I mean, it's a pity that that shot on goal hit the post, but that was a great little bit of play that got it to there, and, and that's a bloody difficult kick so you know for hitting the post I actually gave it a little bit of a clap um the other one was where they were they were trying to get the run on and they're kicking that ball in the middle and he just just legged it to get to that contest and took that mark which stopped them you know a stream down the ground at a really crucial point in time I was quite impressed with his game from those aspects um, also, again, his ability to impact uh, the scoreboard. He had um, six score involvements. Uh, so for an inside mid, um, that's a pretty good effort as well. Um, his tackle count uh, was pretty high. He had uh, six tackles for the game, and including four in the second quarter. So um, again, um, you know, work rate was there from Laird and, you know, just buy-in from a senior player. And, and that's the thing I, I think you talk about buying from the kids, that's one thing, but buying from guys who've been at the club for ten years is quite another. And to see Sloan and, and Tex and Laird and Smith and those guys uh, oh. buy in um, at the at the back end of their careers, uh, it was very pleasing. Yeah, and if you can throw in Seedsman into that lot as well, I thought he he was pretty good too. Um, I thought he was solid, right. yeah. Yeah, um, he was solid. Best player on the ground for mine was, and you can disagree with this if, if you like, was probably this lad, Benny Keys. Um, oh. Well, oh. Now, I love Benny Keys, and I was going to actually uh, do a little bit of a rave on him, for, uh, Fiend, but you've told me not to jump in, so I've sat back. But, uh, <laughs> Benny, but Benny Keys, I think, is an indicator of how we're going to play. He sets an enormous example with his work rate, with his effort, with his chasing, with his tackling. And uh, he just keeps going and going. He's a machine, the boy. And I reckon he is he is a very good barometer of how we're going to play because if, if they follow the, the way that Keys plays in terms of effort, it's going to be very, very hard to get beat. I, I've been saving him up to talk about because I, I just admire the guy. He's come here to a new club. He was uh, he, he did play actually uh, quite a few games for Brisbane in his first year. He couldn't get in the second year because they brought Neil and... Lions in it, which didn't give him room. But he's come to a new club, and I t- tell you what, he's a guy that 
right to the very first game he's played, he gives 100%. And I just love the way he chases, he tackles, he works. And then that's the work ethic we're talking about. That's what why we were why we were so good on the weekend because of that work ethic. And everybody sort of was rubbing off on each other. And Keys is he's one of the first to do it every time. I love him. I, I actually saw a really great comment on Big Footy in the um one of the threads there where they said that Keys finally has friends in the midfield, and I think that really showed. Um, in that endeavour around. The other thing that I found very interesting was the fact that a couple of times when he was chasing Dangerfield, Danger didn't get away. He didn't. And it's like, hmm. And then with what happened with Scott's post-presser where he's trying to say there's something going on or whatever. So he's of, so Danger's possibly injured, but... Nah, Danger's just getting old. Yeah, that's what I thought. To me, it was just like, no, 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 he's just getting old and he doesn't have that little burst of speed anymore. And it was just keys just after him consistently. And you just knew whoever his opponent was, they just knew he was coming and they just had to do a quick pressure kick. And that was great because that gives our back line the ability to intercept or get that hand in. That's what we were missing last year was that pressure from the midfield and Keyes was the lead on that. Correct. Well, I just The oh. other thing too with Benny Keyes is he actually makes the opposition uh, react to him. He's not a re- he's not a yeah. reactive midfielder. He's a proactive midfielder. He'll, he'll get on his bike and he makes – his opponent accountable. Um, you know, he didn't finish all that well at times, uh, probably missed a, a couple of shots that he might have got. But that, that'll come with confidence. And I think yeah. I think he's slowly starting to realise that he can be very, very proactive, put pressure on his opponent and actually make them accountable. Um, I just I, I can't rave highly enough about Ben Keys. I you know his ability to impact the contest, his ability to um, to break things open um, is just so invaluable, and to be able to do it at pace um, as well as at hardness. So we've had some good in and under players like the Crouch Boys, whatever, but his pace and his endeavour and his willingness to work both ways is just fantastic. Yeah, it's a great example for the young boys as well. It really is. Yeah. Now, the other thing that I thought was really good about Nix's game plan is that we had players playing their roles that they were suited for. And we've, we've talked about, um, we might just touch on Sloaney uh, to finish off more the in and under type uh, players. Uh, I thought Sloaney had a pretty solid game as well. Um, certainly uh, that first quarter, seven kicks, he certainly hit the ground running and then he had eight kicks and uh, eight disposals in the second half uh, to finish the game with 17. So I thought his uh, work rate um, and his endeavour was was pretty good. Pardon me. Um, also, again, you talk about score involvements. Uh, seven score involvements for the game was excellent, and four in the second half when it really counted. So, Sloaney, I thought was uh, quite good. But all of those players that we've talked about in the midfield so far, Laird and Keys and Sloan. But then you have a look at our outside runners, and we've tried to adapt Seedsman and Smith and all those blokes into outside runners. But what we got from those blokes uh, this week was metres gained. And I'll start with Lockie Scholl. Lockie Scholl had... um, Mm -hmm. um, Let me have a look. Wasn't that 240 metres in the first quarter? Well, he had had, something. He had 21 possessions, right, 21 possessions. But then if you factor in his metres gained on top of that, um, his metres gained was off the charts, off the charts. Well, that's wrong, minus 305. He had 424 metres gained for the... uh, I thought thought it was higher than that. Yeah, I think it might have been high. I think my uh, my stats machine that, might have just messed up on that one. I, I thought it was about six or six eighty or something like that. Um, yeah. Look, lucky shot. He was outstanding, actually. And uh, oh no, sorry, is... 
424 in the last quarter. My, my apologies. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, that, that makes more sense. Yeah. Um, but, he, you know, for a boy that we, you know, we kept pushing for him to get selected last year, he never got uh, selected and he got picked in the last few games and he, he just showed he should have been playing all year. But uh, he has jumped another level straight away. He was, he was brilliant. He, he played a great game. He was actually, um, his opponent was um, the guy who, Clark, who who had a brilliant, uh, whatever that round was called, game, the, uh, the pre-season game. Yeah, he scored 100. Series. Yeah, he scored 100 and something dream, dream team points, and he only got about 50 against uh, Shoal, whereas Shoal's got about 88 or 90, something like that. He was, Shoal was brilliant. And the, yeah. and you know, one thing you do know is Shoal, once the ball's in his hand, it's going to end up in another teammate's hands as well. doesn't matter whether it's right foot, whether it's left foot. He's just a, a brilliant user of the ball. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, the one I've got up on the and screen he right did, now he, is... He did, make, he did make two blues, <laughs> which got me a little bit annoyed. But no. uh, the other thing I did love was um, uh, the commentators have finally realised, you know, how dual-sided he is. And he got the ball on the member's wing, and I think it was Hudson talked about and he said you know he's so good on you know his left as well as his right and then he does a left foot kick beautiful pass and he's just like see yeah. <laughs> how, how much how, how much do we not want anthony hudson commentating a geelong game oh my god he was, he was <laughs> i actually he was thought he wasn't pitiful. bad he was giving no. us a lot of credit there was there was absolutely no energy in that commentary, none whatsoever. Anyway, were they, were they actually here, or were they calling it from uh, Melbourne? I doesn't matter. I don't care. Um, Smithers, um, a tale of two halves for Smithers, but not because of his effort, but because he had two different roles during the the game, and mm. this illustrates again. He had fifteen disposals and what's that? Uh, 400 metres gained in the first half, and he was very much our running outlet player off halfback. And, you know, he might be great in the midfield and he'll probably get a couple of minutes in the midfield, but he is one of the best running halfbacks in the competition. Just yep. bloody play him there. Just play him there. And, the, and they did. And it that very first contest where he got in front of Selwood and the punch the ball, you know, which was another one that kind of set that tone that he left his player to do that so that Selwood couldn't get, you know, the free mark. He got some really nice little, um, you know, punches and taps in just to stop them getting clean possessions. But the other thing that was really noticeable when that happened was Selwood turning immediately and absolutely baking his teammate who let Smith do that. He wanted that block further down the field, which is an illegal block, but he wanted that to happen. And the fact that he's turned around and spraying his own teammate within the first couple of minutes, I just thought, mm, something's wrong in the state of Denmark. Yeah. Well, and you can see from Smith's second half, uh, five posies and only 68 metres gained, that his role completely changed once Luke Brown went off, um, and particularly when we were struggling with uh, Hinge. Um, and summed up perfectly by those two uh, defensive efforts in the last quarter where he was able to punch the ball away um, yeah. from Tommy Hawkins. So um, really big kudos to Brody for being able to be so attacking at one half of the ground, uh, one half of the game and then refocus and become a real defensive linchpin in the second half. That was fantastic, in my opinion. Yeah. No, you were spot on there, Fiend, and because he he, he was uh, driving the ball in a lot in the first uh, first half. But as you say, when we lo we lost uh, two key uh, defenders on the last line of defence, I mean, yeah. he just had to drop back there because you needed somebody of quality. Otherwise, it would have been open, just open slather down there. And uh, exactly. yeah, and, he, and uh, yeah, he made. He, he, what I liked about it, he scratched and he clawed and he put his body on the line several times. I, I just I really loved what he did. It was. Uh, not Smith-like in the sense of, I mean, he always tries, but the, the physical, that physical aspect of it is clawing and scratching. He doesn't normally do that, but uh, he certainly did in the second half because he had to, and it was good for the team. He, yeah. he was good. Yeah. Um, Seizman, you mentioned earlier, uh, had a consistent game. What do you have? Nine kicks and uh, 200 metres gained in the first half 
and six, uh, sorry, nine disposals, I should say, six disposals in the second half for a uh, you know, 190 odd metres gain. So 400 metres gain for the game. And again, another player that was played to his strengths. He was played as an outside runner um, and uh, he did it well. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, I'm not saying he was outstanding, but he played a. Uh, he played his role, put it that way. And then uh, at times there's been um, and he's played where you don't sight him all day. So, uh, yeah, I thought he, he, he certainly did uh, his part in the job. And he was yeah. really there to try and counter like Menegola or Smith when he was matched up on them. And I, that's what I thought he did quite a ju- good job in respect of because that's where they want to get their drive from. And he covered them so that they couldn't use those players too often as that quick outlet release to get their um, high entries in that they want into the forward line. Yeah. Now, we had a couple of debutants. Uh, Sam Berry, uh, who I thought acquitted himself very well, had um, uh, seven disposals for the match, but I thought his endeavour and his effort um, during the game was second to none. He did a lot of grunt work, uh, got himself uh, involved, um, and he will certainly uh, grow from that effort. Um, I, I felt his well, game was, was excellent. Quite a few tackles as well, mate. And even, yeah, well, and even on top of the ones that he did affect on his own, sometimes he was part of the triple tackle when there was about three of them tackling. So that he, he just, just went straight in hard right from the word go. He, he will be a good player for us and he'll be a tough player for us. Uh, I saw him interviewed uh, today on, on the telly and... Uh, he was saying, oh, I loved it. I loved it out there. <laughs> it was fantastic. Yeah. Well, he looks like that sort of lad, doesn't he? He, he laid yeah. five tackles in the first quarter. You know, And then what had... happened at the start of the second? He was put in the middle to start the second quarter. He was put in the middle at the start of the third quarter. That absolute confidence from the coaching staff, because they recognised what he did, that's I was so pleased to see that that they rewarded what he did and said, okay, kid, keep doing it. Well, and, and I think we saw that a few times from the coaching staff. We didn't we didn't roll with the uh, tried and tested combination uh, every contest. Um, we had no. lots of different combinations in there and it was really good. Um, uh, Sam Berry, uh, you know, he had seven tackles for the game, as I said. His first half was... Really, really good. I mean, he had three contested possessions, five disposals, and as I said, six tackles. Um, fell away a little bit after half time, as you expect from a young lad. But, uh, geez, if he dishes that sort of stuff up every week, um, then uh, um, we're not going to have any problems. Oh, yep. he'll, he'll grow on it. He'll, that, I think that's, you know, the first one up and in a tough game. And I, I think, you know, as, as every time we play, he'll just add a little bit more to it. He's that type of guy. Um, the the other one was directly after the Kelly hit, which was the handball was to Berry. Now he had two Geelong like midfielders coming at him. He just did a little run to the side to create the space and then cut back in, and it was a beautiful soft kick to yeah, Tex on the lead. And there were a couple of kicks that he did, and I'm yeah. just looking at him going, they are such nice, perfect kicks for a forward. Yeah. This kid's and got a, an, almost an elite kick on him. Just looking well, at and that. Well, and that was a little bit of a uh, question mark on him, uh, disposal. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and they no, said look, they were working on him. I, I thought he looked composed. I thought he looked involved, uh, and he certainly didn't look out of place. Uh, Harry Schomburg, um, a really consistent game, I thought, without being yeah. a standout. Um, he had, what's that, uh, 15 disposals. Uh, seven contested possessions, laid a couple of tackles. Um, he actually, to me, looked a little bit more prominent in the second half. Um, yeah. But uh, the stats say that he was pretty consistent across four quarters. Yeah, I like his game. He just he uh, he cruised around. He did what you know if it needed a bit of a physicality, he did that. But he's also he he is uh, a good midfield in the sense that he can go in or he can also stay out as well to get the ball. So he's uh, he 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 and Barry they they're gonna go in different directions. Barry's the hard nut. But um I think I think he'll probably end up more of an outside midfielder. Um one somebody you'll give the ball to and he and use it beautifully. 
Oh, I liked his game. He's, he's got real promise. I think he's just improving every time he plays. Yeah, well, you know and, what my reps are on him, mate. Yeah. And it was just like every time he got the ball, he just made something happen. We saw that a bit last year, but it was the consistency of this That's game, it. which was really nice to see. It's his yeah, composure, I like the ball in his hand. His composure in traffic and his ability to make oh. the right decision. And not only to not only the right decision, but one which actually creates play. That's the bit that I keep noticing from Harry. Yep. And sometimes you know, he's only young, so it only happens once or twice a game, but there are times where you think, oh, he's just got he's he's got German like time in close, if you ask yeah. me. Um, he just, he's he just makes got the that game. little extra it slows down oh. for him. Yeah. Um, now, uh, the young lad who's got a very unfortunate father uh, did quite well too. Um, <laughs> young, young Jimmy Rowe. Rowe. I thought he was <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> oh, he was brilliant, wasn't he? And I'll tell you what, uh, I will have to admit, I did actually squeeze a tear out when he when he kicked his first goal. He was just, <laughs> what, just watching that pure joy as he kicked the goal, racing around like a bloody lunatic, saw a text. Well, let a couple of weeks, just about had him on the spot. <laughs> oh, I was, it, was, it was just brilliant to see such uh, excitement in, 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 in a Crows player and, and yeah. in the team and the reaction. That, that yeah, somebody said celebration of the year. That type of thing generates excitement in a team. It gets a team going. I think I think Ray was brilliant. I, I just loved him. He's, a, he's going to be a very, very good player for us. He's a footballer, and that exactly. celebration was he has worked his butt off to get to AFL level. It's been denied him for so long, and he has worked so hard for it. It was just that culmination of, oh, my God, this has happened, and it was just brilliant to see. And he did a very similar celebration for his second one, so I think he's always going to get excited whenever he kicks a goal. Yeah. But the way he moves and just getting to the front of the pack or – just some little taps and things like that. He's just a smart footballer. Clever. He is really. He really reads the play brilliantly. And yeah, he, you know, he's he's not the fastest player, but he's not the slowest. He's just a brilliant no. reader of the ball. And uh, I want you know, I used to watch him playing for West Tor- uh, would be West Torrens, and always thought, gee, that boy reads the, reads the play so well. I was yeah. I was delighted when we chose him because um, we've never had anybody who does that. Well, I, you know, that's what I noticed about him, Macca, was where he was putting himself around the contest. He seemed to just always be in the right position um, for a small forward. Uh, you know, when he was crumbing, he seemed to be able to read um, read the hands and read the pack really well. Um, he got up the ground when he needed to. Uh, but the biggest thing for mine is you need a couple of blokes around the club like that that their their enthusiasm is infectious and he's one of those blokes that as you say you know he worked really hard to get his opportunity he's making the most of it my biggest worry about jimmy rowe was his fitness but he's put that to bed because he's obviously done a mountain of work to get himself uh, afl fit um, and credit to him for that um so you know uh, we're not losing anything at all um, by having him in the team uh, instead of Tyson Stengel, in my opinion. No, 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 nothing at all, because the only thing we've got is um, a bloke of uh, outstanding character who just wants to be a footballer, and, uh, and that's what he's living for, to be a footballer, and he's achieved it. He played his first game, and he played it as if his life depended on it. And 100%. But, but he, then he, when he did something, the pure joy and that just rushed out of him and uh, into his teammates. It was yeah, it created excitement for the team. It, yeah. he, he was good for the team. Yeah. Now uh, Ned McHenry is another one that has been a bit iffy uh, over the last couple of years, but I liked his game. <coughs> Pardon me. I liked his game. I thought he worked himself into the game um, after a little bit of a slow start. Um, how we use him uh, and Murphy and Rowe is going to be interesting. Um, but, um, you know, what do you have? He had nine disposals. He had uh, five uh, score involvements, laid a couple of tackles in the first quarter. Um, I just felt like there's enough there to persevere with at the moment. Uh, Ned, I think he's going to come under pressure, I think, 
uh, as a couple of the other blokes come on um, and possibly, uh, you know, after one or two more drafts. But right now, uh, what's in front of us, uh, he certainly deserves his spot. Yeah, well, where I used to criticise him last year and it was instead of playing bloody football and trying to get the ball, he was, all he was interested in was being an irritating little ant just getting up everybody's nose rather than getting the ball. And whereas I don't, I don't know, again, whether it's our new coaches have spoken to him about the way he plays, but I did notice when we played against Port Adelaide, I made a comment after that game that I thought I saw it for the first time I could see a footballer in him. And that was because he was after the ball rather than uh, trying to be irritating. And uh, I thought his game on the weekend was pretty solid because, I mean, he wasn't, I don't know what his percentage on the ground time was, but uh, um. I did notice him. But he, I thought he was pretty good overall when he got his, when he got his opportunity and he was, he was controlled in the sense of his aggression was at the player with the ball uh, yeah. and or getting the ball. And if he plays like that, as you say, I think he'll probably get overrun in time, but he. But in the meantime, he, he might play some good games for us. Yeah, eighty-five they, percent time on ground, Max. So he spent most yeah. of it on there. Well, we know his endurance is absolutely outstanding, and they played him on the wing and they played him in the middle as well as um, generally the high half forward was his role. He didn't go deeper. He was often the, the higher half forward. And I noticed that they used him and Murphy as well, particularly in that first quarter. We would actually put Murphy behind um, a like a ball up and he was hitting that pack at speed coming through. And McHenry was doing a, a similar little role every so often. Um but he was a little bit more of the in and under. But I liked the fact that we had that different mix through the midfield, that we weren't just sticking to the same ones. And, you know, a couple of times that you we had McHenry and Berry in the midfield at the same time yep. or yep. with Schoenberg and Berry and then only one other senior player. Yep. We had a bit of speed. We had a different look. And, th- and I think that enthusiasm. Around yeah. that centre bounce helps. And with regards to Henry, Nato Dog on YouTube chat makes a really good point. Um, he does does look a little bit more balanced now. He um, he he's he's still uh, aggressive and in, you know doesn't mind getting under people's skin. But I think he's more focused now on actually playing footy. Uh, and probably, yeah. I think that comes from belief. Uh, I think that com- I think he was overcompensating perhaps for feeling that he was not quite up to scratch in terms of his footy, that he had to do something else. Whereas now, I think um, he believes that he can play at the level and now we're actually seeing him play footy, um, you know, rather than just uh, do the gab. So uh, is there anyone else we want to talk about before we finish up? Look, um, but- I won't put... I won't put Butts' stats up there because it was all defensive, but Geordie did a fantastic job on... Absolutely Tony amazing Hawkins. job. And um, and he read it really well. And it was quite funny when they were talking about, oh, you know, he's doing, he's, you know, staying back or whatever. And it's like, look at the size difference. He's not going to win a contest if he gets into a, a push and shove with Hawkins. He was a, so clever about what he did. And a couple of times, you know, the way he took the front position and just outmarked him. And we also were very willing to use Butts as one of those kicks out of defense um, because he's got a really nice kick on him uh, and he makes good decisions. The other one that really surprised me was Hinge as well with his decision-making and his kicks and I th- pity about his shoulder popping out a couple of times, mm. but I think that kid's going to be a very nice little pickup for us as well. Yeah, he's, on, he's got um, a beautiful leg. On, on Geordie Butts, Mac, I don't know about you, but I thought it was a massive fail by Chris Scott to not try and isolate Hawkins on Butts. I thought it was yep. a, th- yeah, it was just staring him in the face to pull <laughs> everyone out of that forward line and isolate yeah. Tommy Hawkins. Uh, just staring him in the face. But I don't think Scott's a good coach. I never oh, have. No, I don't. Good I, I don't. I don't either. And that's. I think that's another indicator. He he didn't really pull too many moves. Um, I felt like he needed to um, open up their forward line a, a couple of times where Hawkins was able to lead up. Um, you know, there's not a lot not a lot that any defender can do under those circumstances. 
But I just felt like if you wanted to to break Adelaide's defense, our defense was our Achilles heel this week. Let's let's make no doubt about it. You know, we we light on personnel. We we didn't have Talia. Um, we didn't have Murray. Um, you know, uh, Kelly went down. We were cooked. Brown, Brown, Brown gone as well. Yeah, yeah but I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking about tools. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. You know, and they had they had the players. They they could have afforded to send Lockie Henderson down there. I, I don't know why he why they didn't try sending Lockie Henderson forward, um, just to try and stretch us because that was our that was the area of concern. We were breaking even them even with them in the midfield. Um, they just needed to try and give put a different shape towards us, and they never and they never did. They never did. No, I've always thought he can't coach in. He got a premiership first year. He inherited a good side. He's had good side. They coach themselves. Well, they coach themselves. You're dead right. And, and, and he then, said that. He, he has failed time after time after time. And they'll always fail while he's there. Yeah. Always. Um, look, the rest of them, uh, the only other one I want to spend any time on at all is Riley O'Brien. I felt that he battled well in the ruck, but um, he didn't have a very good day overhead. He took one really good mark towards the end there. But uh, gee, dropped a lot of marks, so that's something that he's going to have to work on, I think. But he did. He did a lot of great work around the ground. We we got the Riley that we know. I I think, you know, who he was up against those jumpers. I thought he countered that quite well. Oh, um, he's in trouble. Overall. Oh yeah, he was because they th- those are the type of players that he kind of struggles with a little bit. But I thought the fact that he becomes our extra midfielder. Um, there was a couple of nice linking plays that he was involved with. To me, it was a solid game from Riley. Well, I thought he was in because, uh, you know, Geelong had two rucks that were leaping over the top of him. Um, and it's and I agree with the comment that just came up from PJ Crow. One of his poorer games. Uh, but he still did quite a few good things. And one thing you can always get from Riley O'Brien, you'll get 100% effort whether he's beaten yep. or not. So uh, you, you can't knock the guy, you know, He's not always going to be the best player and he's not always not going to beat his opponent, but you know that he'll be trying to. So, And he's the best we've got. So um, I'd say, yeah, I'd give him a tick for effort. Not necessarily one of his great games, though. No. And concerningly, uh, Donuts in the last quarter in terms of hit-outs, um, he had, uh, what's that, 12, 19 hit-outs for the game. Uh, only took the one mark for the game in the second quarter. Um, so, you know, uh, I hear what you're saying, Nick, but I was concerned about Riley's game. Um, I felt like they had an opportunity by nullifying O'Brien to, um, to actually get on top of us and exploit. He only had six disposals for the game too. Um, so, yeah, he, uh, it was, it was a worry, but, you know, he did come good, uh, um, you know, uh, at the beginning, uh, but he did fade off quite quite substantially. I thought. Yeah, he may have been even carrying an injury because he was. To me, he just wasn't quite as good as he normally is. And but but he did have to contend with two leaping players, which is uh, Rob's not a leaper. I mean, he's he's a, he's a, uh, a strong bodied person who he can get a bit off the ground, but he's not a, he's not a huge leaper. But they. Both of the two uh, ruckmen that uh, Geelong were, uh, were using, they are, they are very good at getting off the ground. Well, but, the, one thing that I did, the one thing I did oh. notice about O'Brien, um, and maybe this explains some of his um, lack of focus in other areas, he was pushing back almost as soon as uh, a centre contest was contested. He was pushing back. So he clearly had a mandate to try and fill a hole defensively. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think, and he did very well. He broke up a lot of marking contests by just being in that contest. So, uh, you know, it certainly wasn't one of his standout games, but he still, he still, um, played a role for the team. Um, that's the players who played, but with the two injuries thing, who's going to take their spot? All right, well, looks like we've finished the uh, statistical roundup. Thanks, Macca. Um, <laughs> well, you said the last player. <laughs> I said the last player in detail. Um, just quickly, I'll just cover off. Uh, Duday looked like he needed the run. Um, Hamill, 
uh, flashes, flashes. Uh, he did but some, probably did also some needed really him. nice, did some really nice little punches and intercept yeah. kind of hands in the space. And he kept his, you know, his man pretty quiet. Yeah, McPherson I thought was pretty solid. A um, couple of really good goal saving efforts uh, as well. So he was certainly. Um, Good in defence, and I think I've pretty much covered everyone. Now, who's going to cover? Well, I don't know what what's um, what's wrong with Murray. Ankle Murray, rolled an ankle, but he, he made, but it was on the outside of his ankle, which is a good side of it. Uh, yeah. If you got to roll it, so yeah. he, you know, you, you'd think that he might be available this week. Um, well, it depends on how Sydney. Off. Sorry, it depends on how Sydney. Um, structure up and I haven't had, had a look at their game but um, we may actually choose to bring in Worrell for uh, Kelly instead of Murray that's what I was going to say <laughs> exactly what I was going to say but um, they, they they structure up fairly small up forward uh, Sydney uh, but, you know they not unlike ourselves but probably much, uh, maybe even one sort one tall less the, the, they have a very very mobile forward line yeah um, it'll depend if Buddy plays. Um, I don't know what his injury situation is, but um, uh, the other one, Luke Brown, uh, that's an interesting one. I could say I can... Because uh, they've got Papley, haven't they? Um, uh, yeah, and he was, he was being played pretty well. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. good. Um, and Luke Brown would normally go to Tom Papley, I think. I just wonder whether they might actually push um, Smith back into a defensive role like he played in the second half and uh, Will Hamill might get a, a bit more time um, and they might actually bring in a Chase Jones, someone like that. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting because Brown, nobody ever thinks much about Brown and you don't have to think much about Brown. He stays there and he's been spotting every week and he does a very good job every week. He's And, you know, he doesn't really, uh, he's not really prominent. He just stops his man from doing uh, a lot of damage. And, he, you know, he's just a bloody good player to have. And when he's out, then that's when you notice him. Yeah, well, he always takes the best small forward, doesn't he? Um, always, so- always. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting. I've been a little bit of an advocate for a Lockie Murphy going down back and playing as a back pocket. Um, I don't know whether they'll do that or not, but um, I could see move. that happening. That was his first season. That was his first season in the SNFL, and he's yeah. excellent at it. Yeah, so that might be a, uh, welcome to Kempy too, who's been pl- listening to last week's podcast all day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for joining us, Kempy. Good, good work. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> Top one of the week. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the big question for mine is whether we can find room for Tilthorpe this week. Yeah. Because I, um, I would have played him. I, I would have played Riley Tilthorpe this week, last week. If they, if they didn't play him last week, I can't see them playing this week. I, it, to me, it seems like they've got a little bit of a plan of how they're going to bring him in and which would be probably to play perhaps two, three SAFL games, um, then bring him in uh, rather than just throw him up there without any games. Yeah. Uh, and I think Nix has almost indicated that. So I don't think he'll be coming in. Um, yeah. So it's more more who's going to come in down back. And, I and you know, I think Worrell could be a good chance. Um, they, more, they may have to invent something else to take Brown's spot. Um, with somebody who normally plays in another spot, like maybe like a Lockie Murphy, I don't know. But uh, gee, uh, Papley is a very dangerous forward. You kind of need somebody that can go with him. And yeah, uh, that's why I'm thinking Murphy. Uh, although Papley's not bad overhead either, and Murphy probably might struggle in that regard. But oh, um, he's got a leap on him. Oh, he's got a leap on him, but that doesn't make him good defensively aerially. Um, no, he was in the SNFL, but that is a different level. Yeah, um, I reckon they'll probably bring in Jones um, for Brown and shuffle the deck a little bit. Um, uh, PJ Crows makes a good per- point. McPherson yeah. might get Papley. Uh, Duday might get Papley as well. Um, so there are options there. Um, uh, who's the other one? Mitch Hinge. See, there's another running halfback. Um, 
So you know, well, we're really we're really stretched. On his shoulder. Yeah, well, he was the he was the uh, injury uh, reserve interchange, wasn't he? So yeah, yeah. So he was in the original 22. So if we look at the original 22, it's only really, the, uh, as long as McCann's okay, there'll be only the two and they'll be down back to replace. And so, But uh, Davis can't play. He's out injured. So let me yeah, suggest no, he's, a, he's no good. No. No so, good. No, it's going to be an interesting time to see. And, uh, it, and, the, other, and the other big question, of course, is that can we, can we repeat? The same enthusiasm, the same effort when we're playing away from home. Um, we had, you know, had the advantage of having uh, the crowd on our side. Uh, umpires gave us a reasonable run. Um, yep. this, this time we'll be playing away, and we'll be playing against a side who played very, very well themselves. So I think this will be a very interesting test. We've always played reasonably well up in Sydney for some reason, but um, you know, I think this Sydney side. I just watch them. They've got some very, very nice young lads in there, and. Uh, yeah, it'll be a very a good game. It'll be a good test for us. A very good test, Smacker, and a good point. Um, playing away, uh, you would think that there might even be a little bit of a, a letdown after such a big win. Uh, probably could go either way, that one. Um, but certainly with the lack of crowd um, geeing them on, it'll be a different environment for some of those boys. Um, I, it, look, it will be close. I, Sydney have still got a bit of quality in their team um, through the midfield, so... Uh, and they've done well to to win first up against Brisbane. Um, you know, it's quite obvious. I think that the lower teams are going to have a bit of a leg up for the first two to three weeks um, against some of these uh, teams that finish high on the ladder. Although it didn't seem to bother Richmond much. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, selection is going to be interesting. Uh, look, uh, they could decide to play Tommy Lynch down back and maybe bring Fogarty in. Uh, there's there's it's going to be very, very interesting selection. Um, I don't know. I don't know which way I'm leaning, to be honest with you. Well, Seisman has played down back before too. Yeah, he's not a defensive yep. player, mate. He, he used to be. He originally started off as a half back flanker. Yeah, but in the Brody Smith role, I don't think he's. As, I, I would prefer to see Brody play a more defensive role and Seeds be that running half back uh, rather than rely on Seisman for defensive work. Yeah, I, I am, having having not uh, told you that, I, I don't think I'd really like him there myself. But what about McAsee? Do, do we actually say the boy you have to play and play well? Well, I don't have a read on how the um, how the the scratch match went, so I don't know how Fisher went. My impression though is that they're going to give him a block of games in the twos. Um, so I, I I would be doubtful. Just give him the continuity. Yeah, I would be doubtful that we'll see. Mackesy. If there's whispers that Franklin gets selected, we may see Mackesy. Um, I, I think we're more likely to see Worrell come in for for Jake Kelly, and then it's a bit of a bit of a toss up after that. Well, and the, yeah. the other thing though is also what the ground condition is going to be because they've got yeah. flooding <laughs> and everything else at the moment. That's not going to fine up until about Wednesday. Yeah, well, that'll drain off though. Yo, <laughs> how heavy it is, though. Yeah, that, I know, but I the SCG's got fantastic drainage being a cricket ground. No, it, it, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. But I don't I don't think they will pick back a C because Nick's has said quite clearly that to play in our t- uh, team, you have to earn it. You have to earn yeah. your spot. Yeah. And, and McAsee's done nothing like that. No. Look, uh, it's been a pretty eventful. Oh, I would just quickly before we finish up, we should uh, uh, just mention that the, um, the women girls won today. What's the they score did abs- absolutely smashed. Hang on, let me pull it up again. Um, the Western Bulldogs. So we've now secured our spot for the finals. Um, so in the end, it was seventy-eight to twenty-two. So twelve goals six to three goals four. Yeah. Um, it was. A very, very good game uh, to watch if you get a chance. I highly recommend going back and having a look at it. Yeah, I watched uh, the first Shear. half. They played really well. Oh, they did. And Chloe Shear, you know, three three goals. There was some brilliant um, play from end to end, just that switch across the ground that we know in their premiership, like their last premiership year, that, that kind of damaging switch across was happening. Yeah. Um, the feeling I'm 
um, my dad's pointed this out, the feeling, um, and I agree with him on this, is that Clark, he's trying, he's just playing every player, having a look at them. So then he knows when he goes into finals, this is the team I'm going to play. So he's he's doing a little bit of a rotation policy is, is what it seems. And, and, and he's also making players play in lots of different positions um, just to to just to have that little look at what they're doing um but it was it was very emphatic today yeah yeah and that um, and that showed, showed us up for finals didn't it yeah that shows us yep. up for finals we've still got a chance for top two i believe um we so, do uh, if we beat collingwood next week yeah um they look really sharp today uh, really sharp oh. so well done to them um Thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight on chat, on YouTube chat, on Twitch. Fantastic to see everyone. Um, I'm still having trouble with my bloody website, which means that the podcast audio feed is still down. Um, so me telling you this is not very useful because the people that want to listen to it audio can't hear it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm madly trying to work with my provider to get the website back up and running, which hosts my podcast feed. So fingers crossed, this will be up very soon. Um, watch out for uh, our work during the week. Uh, Nikki, nice to have you back on deck. Maka, nice to see you as always. Yep. And we'll thanks be here all, next week. Thanks I mean, to miss, all our... Miss, miss you guys last week. Yeah, thanks to all our patrons too on Patreon. We've had a couple of uh, new patrons this week join in on patreon so that's much appreciated if you want to join in on patreon just uh, get around patreon.com forward slash afl crowcast and i reckon that's it that's about it we'll see you again Ciao, this buddy. time or 7 30 next sunday see you guys yeah not all not all <laughs>